Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about pumps, valves, and manipulating the process state. We learned in an earlier video that we can control the measured or thermodynamic state by adjusting the equipment state, specifically by adjusting flows of mass or heat with pumps and valves. Pumps add energy to fluids while valves subtract energy, allowing us to create gradients and thus change. We can regulate flows with control valves and variable speed pumps. Let's begin with pumps. We can divide pumps into three useful types, centrifugal, positive displacement, and diaphragm. In a centrifugal pump, an impeller forces the fluid, which enters at the center, to the outside radius and then through an exit. You can build very large high capacity centrifugal pumps, which will easily handle low viscosity fluids. Centrifugal pumps have some key weaknesses. Passing through the impeller imparts high shear to the fluid. Emulsions or delicate large molecules like proteins may be destroyed in a centrifugal pump. At the center of the impeller, the feed point, which is a low pressure point, can cause a high vapor pressure liquid to flash or to cavitate, damaging or disabling the pump. A pump curve graphs pressure on the y-axis versus volumetric flow on the x-axis. Although the pressure is generally converted to a pump head or height in meters or feet by dividing pressure by density and gravity. Note that the pressure is close to constant at the no flow or deadhead pressure up to 60 to 70% of the pump's flow capacity. This is the region we usually find ourselves operating the pump in. The power that a pump delivers, or at least an ideal frictionless pump, is the product of the pressure increase delta P and the volumetric flow capital V. If we convert the pressure gain into the product of density and velocity squared over two via Bernoulli, and then convert the velocity into the radius r multiplied by the angular velocity omega, you can see that the power is proportional to r squared or omega squared. As either the impeller diameter or the pump speed decreases, the pump power will decrease with its square. This is important to remember with variable speed pumps. A centrifugal pump running at 90% of its top speed delivers only 81% of the power. See the text for more. A positive displacement pump creates a cavity at the feed point, seals that cavity and displaces it to the exit point, and then makes the cavity shrink or disappear to push out the fluid. Shown as a gear pump, but vein pumps and eccentric rotary pumps are doing the same. Positive displacement pumps handle high viscosity fluids well and are relatively low shear, but low viscosity fluids slip past the gears or veins of positive displacement pumps. PD pumps can generate higher pressures but lower flows than similar sized and priced centrifugal pumps. Their pump curves are essentially rectangular, delivering constant pressure for any flow, and the flow delivered will be linear with the pump speed for a variable speed pump. Diaphragm pumps use a piston chamber combined with two check valves to force fluids forward. The check valves only allow flow in one direction, while the diaphragm and piston enlarges the chamber to pull fluid in the inlet, then shrinks the chamber to push fluid out the outlet. Diaphragm pumps are inexpensive and very low shear, but they deliver pulsing periodic flow at low pressures. The seals and check valves tend to leak, so there is a significant safety hazard with flammable or toxic fluids. The flow rate delivered depends on the frequency and amplitude of the piston movement. Many metering pumps are diaphragm pumps. There are thousands of valves in a process plant. Most are manual valves there for isolation purposes, for maintenance and safety. We will focus on the actuated block valves and control valves used by the control system. The most common type of actuated block valve is the full port ball valve which seals reliably when closed and generates no extra friction when open. Most actuators are solenoid valves that allow or stop compressed air 
when triggered by an electrical signal. Almost all valves have a passive or fail position. That is the position that they revert to if they lose either control signal, compressed air, or electrical power. This is accomplished by the action of a spring and is very reliable. Valves can be set up to be fail open or fail closed. Engineers should choose based on which is safest. Fail closed is the default. All fail open valves should be marked FO on PNIDs. Limit switches or analog feedback measure the position of a valve. It is very useful to know whether valves are following their commands, both for troubleshooting a process and for safety. A limit switch is an electrical contact that is placed at the end of travel for a rotating actuated block valve. Analog feedback measures the rotation of either a block or control valve continuously from zero to 100% open. On a PNID or instrument list, label limit switches SVO and SVC for solenoid valve open and closed and analog feedback SVZ or CVZ to match the solenoid or control valve that it is put on. Valve feedback is not expensive these days and any valve worth automating is important enough to productivity or safety to justify feedback. Control valves are adjustable sources of friction used to control flow rate or pressure, particularly in continuous feedback loops. They work by creating a variable orifice for the fluid. We would like them to provide a linear response, seal completely when closed, yield little pressure drop when open, and to be reliable and expensive. Sadly, any physical design that delivers linearity will generate pressure drop and fail to seal. Always assume a control valve is going to leak. So, the trade-off is largely between linearity and robustness. In the relationship between flow and valve position, for a constant upstream pressure, no valve is perfectly linear, but diaphragm valves are the closest. Sadly, they tend to wear out in two to three years. V-ball control valves use a ball valve with a V-shaped notch rather than the full port of a block valve. V-balls are fairly linear between 20 to 80% open and last five years or more. There are other compromises available if you do some research, but these are the most common. Control valves should be sized to use 30% of the available pressure drop. We predict its pressure drop using the CV specification for that valve. See the text for details. Hysteresis is a common problem that results when control valves wear out. See the text or a future video. Use of a variable speed pump, which doesn't wear out like a control valve, can end the need for a control valve in some circumstances. See a discussion of why variable speed pumps should be more widely used in the text of Chapter 2. Look for a full text, exercises, and more video at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.